Hey y'all, welcome to the Dixie Cryptid channel. I really appreciate you clicking on the channel. You might hear some heavy equipment going in the background. That's my old lady out there. I've got her sandblasting off some engine blocks that I'm going to paint later today. She's busy. If she wants to eat tonight, she's got to get this sandblasted done. So that's the noise you're hearing behind me. Welcome to the podcast. We've got two really, really good stories in this podcast, and I hope you guys enjoy them. All right, here we go. All right, here's a good, good, good little story. It's a secondhand story, and you guys are going to love this. I loved reading it. The writer's name is Sam, and here's what he writes. This is a story I heard a few years ago. It would be a crime not to let your audience hear this. The story takes place in the 1980s in the state of Utah and is about two young boys who had the shock of their lives when they came face to face with something that most people claim doesn't exist. A mining company needed two workers to clean out a mine located on a mountainside in a remote area in Utah. As luck would have it, they found two college students from Washington State who were interested in the job. One of the boys was 19 and the other was 21. Strangely enough, they were both Bigfoot enthusiasts and were no strangers to being alone in the woods. They arrived at the mine and set up their campsite. It was a very organized campsite, and these lads were to remove debris from this mine with buckets. A few days passed, and then early one morning, one of the mine owners was awoken to the ring of his phone. It was his partner. The boys had called him from a phone booth in town. Apparently, they had wrecked their car coming down the mountainside. Baffled by the news, the two men met and then drove to the town through pouring rain. While driving, the man who took the call said the boys claimed to have been chased off the mountain by a Sasquatch. They both laughed it off, thinking these kids just wanted out of the job and needed help after wrecking their car. Had they not wrecked, the owners probably would have never heard from them again. This is what they thought, but they would soon discover the truth. Finally making it to town, with the rain increasing throughout the drive, they found the phone booth where the boys asked them to meet. They expected to find the boys in a nearby cafe or place of business, and they never actually looked at the phone booth until one of the young men yelled for them. They looked over, and inside the booth were two college-aged men huddled together, wearing nothing but their boxer shorts. They ushered the kids into the truck where it was warm and then drove a block to the first cafe they saw. Once inside, the waitress brought them towels and blankets, and soon they were dry and warming up. And with some food finally in their stomachs, the two employees told this story. The young men had taken the job so that they could be in an area with reported Bigfoot activity. Their plan was to do their work and spend their off time searching for the creature. While doing research in Washington State, they had captured vocalizations, Bigfoot screams and howls, and had brought the recordings along with them to play on a loudspeaker. After finishing their work the evening before, they set up the loudspeaker and began playing the sounds. Something roared at them from a distance away. They turned the speaker off, and then they discussed it, and they ultimately agreed that the roar they heard was a bear. So they restarted blasting the sounds into the woods. Well, whatever had roared before began roaring again. and This time it was closer, and it was a continuous series of sounds. Now they knew they had attracted a Sasquatch, and there was no doubt, and they were excited. They admitted that they should have left the area at that point, but in their minds, this was the coolest thing to happen since their Bigfoot investigations had begun. So they cranked up the volume and let the recording play. The roars got louder, and they could now hear this thing coming toward them. Branches were cracking as it moved closer, and they could actually hear the footfalls of the creature. 
Now, not wanting to overdo it, they cut the feed to the speaker and moved into their tent, where they apparently thought it was safe, and then began making vocalizations with their own voices. I think we can all agree that these young men had a screw loose. Maybe they were just overconfident that they were safe. That was about to change, though. The tent was quickly jerked upward, lifting both men into the air until the floor of the tent ripped out, sending them a few feet to the ground. In an instant, they were sandwiched between two enormous, smelly creatures. The only conclusion would be obvious that the creatures had no interest in harming these young men because they turned their attention to the camp and began tearing everything to pieces. With the raging creature's attention elsewhere, the young men saw their chance to escape. In only their underwear, they sprinted to the car and took off down the mountain. At some point in their escape, they hit a tree, which made the car useless. And from there, they walked into town through the freezing rain. But still, their employers weren't sure if they believed the story. One suggested they get the young men into some clothes and then go to their campsite to salvage what they could. Both of the students shook their heads and emphatically stated that they were never going on that mountain again. And as a matter of fact, they were clear about getting home as soon as they could, even if they had to walk back to Washington State in the freezing rain wearing only their boxers. The owner of the cafe had joined the group. He told all the men that he would get the young men outfitted in new clothes and help them find a way home. The two owners of the mine, however, were curious about the story and they wanted to visit the camp. If this story were true, there would be evidence to back the story up. So up the mountain they drove in the rain. By the time they reached the campsite, the rain had stopped. And on the way up the old mining road, they stopped to inspect the car the men had abandoned. It looked like they had hit every tree and rock on their way down. The damage they saw was not from the impact where the car now sat. They had hit everything. It was in a place from which it could be easily towed. Whether the car was worth salvaging would be up to the body shop and the insurance adjuster, assuming these kids had insurance. Now at the campsite, the owner stood at a distance, taking in the destruction. It looked nothing like a campsite. It was more like a corner of a landfill. Debris was scattered about and nothing looked like its previous form. A cast iron stove that was once inside the tent was now broken into pieces and pieces of cast littered the area. Coolers had been crushed and tents and sleeping bags shredded. Even suitcases were ripped open and the boys' clothes didn't survive. Every garment was torn apart. Everything that once made up the organized campsite was now destroyed. Even the soda cans were crushed flat. Every single can. One of the owners bent over and picked up a piece of a toothbrush. Neither man had spoken since they arrived. And finally, one broke the silence. You believe this Sasquatch story? Well, I didn't until I saw this. I think we need to sell this claim and cut our losses, said the other. Well, you read my mind. Let's get off this mountain. The mine owners left the mountain and then made certain the college students had a way back to Washington. And after thanking the cafe owner, they left. And they never returned to their claim. All right, there's a good secondhand story. I mean, you, you just can't get any better than that. Oh, I loved reading this and I love sharing it with you. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I don't know exactly when this happened. Uh, it's a secondhand story and it's probably one of those stories where nobody actually gives it a date. Oh, it says it takes place in the 1980s in the very first paragraph. So I'd forgotten that, but they're in the mid 1980s. So these guys are probably older guys now, but they, I bet they could tell a story now. But they've told other people. Anyway, thanks, Sam, for the story. It's really good. I really appreciate you. Did y'all know Yeti Bars has a contest going on? 
we're not only going to offer various discounts the whole month of December, but we're also going to give $1,000 cash out on the 15th to spend on gifts. To qualify, just make an order of any size in your end. That's a $1,000 cash giveaway? Is that right? Am I reading that right? Anyone who has ever bought from us or does before the 15th qualifies to win. Guys, go take a look at their soap. You'll be browsing through their website for 20 minutes. They have so many products and everything they sell is really nice. Go check them out at YetiBars.net and YetiBars on Facebook. Here is an email that I received from TJ Neely. TJ is an author, and I didn't realize this until I opened his email, but he has a book that's available on Amazon called Revelations, The Human Hominid Connection. It's been out since November 2020. It's not a really super long book, but it's uh, it looks pretty good. It's available on Kindle. And I think you can get it in hardcover or maybe paperback. But the link will be in the description after you hear this story. If it sounds interesting to you, it's probably a pretty good book. I have not read it. I have not bought the book. I plan to when I need something to read. I've got it on my wish list. But if this story is any indication of how the book is, it's probably pretty good. So let's get into his email. This is great. This is really good. TJ writes, this is the story of how my fascination with Sasquatch began, and it comes right out of my book titled Revelations, The Humid Hominid Connection. I've always loved the great Northwest, and Washington State is certainly one of the most beautiful. While up in the Wenatchee National Forest in 1984, participating in an Army ROTC field training exercise, I had an extraordinary experience, one that changed my perspective on life forever. This is a story of my first encounter, and it set me on a path to be an independent researcher. While the other cadets were sound asleep in their mummy bags under the pine trees, I was pulling duty as a sentry and fire guard. Guarding the fire and keeping it going was standard operating procedure if you wanted to keep all the critters away and have something to start the coffee in the morning. We also had to tend to the fire to practice good fire safety while in the forest. We would all take turns and relieve each other every hour on the hour throughout the night. My shift started at 0200 and was almost over. After kicking my replacement twice and trying to wake him up, I realized that he was not up to the task. And since it was already about 0330 now, I decided to stay by the fire and keep it going until dawn. I recalled with a chuckle a story by a few FTXs before that a herd of elk passed through the camp and one stopped to lick the salt off the face of one of the cadets. Up until then... Who would have guessed that a person could jump up and run off screaming into the night while still zipped up in a sleeping bag, but somehow he did it. I guess all you have to do is get one foot out through the zipper and then you can run forever. So there I was all along, keeping an eye on the low burning campfire. I was sitting face to face to the south with the fire in front of me because the cool night air was drifting through the pines from north to south and I wanted to keep the smoke out of my eyes. Suddenly, I heard something coming through the woods. The sound was over my right shoulder at about my five o'clock position. Whatever it was, it had to be big and heavy, because limbs and twigs were snapping and popping, and it was coming up the hill right for our campsite. I was frozen with excitement and anticipation, waiting to see another herd of elk stroll through. And then everything went quiet, like I had just fallen into a dead zone. It was a strange and unusual silence, the kind where time even stands still, just before something bad happens. I couldn't see or hear a thing, only that within the glow of the campfire and the rhythmic snoring of a few cadets. I quickly started adding more sticks to the fire to increase its signature in the range of its light. And that's when I realized that I was not the only thing awake in the forest. 
I sensed the presence of something there, standing next to a big pine tree at my two o'clock, just on the edge of the firelight about 30 feet away. I could see it best only in my peripheral view. At night, our vision relies on two primary mechanisms, receptors, rods, and cones in your eye, which collect and send light impulses to the brain. At night, a blind spot is evident when looking straight ahead, so your visual acuity is better at night when using your peripheral view. This enabled me to definitely see the silhouette of something dark and huge, standing upright. Yes, it was vertical. And it was no elk, and it certainly was not a bear standing on its hind legs. It took me a few seconds to process what I was seeing, and it was something that was not supposed to exist. It was at that point when my blood ran cold and the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I still get chills now as I recount this part of the story. I remember saying under my breath, Wow, they really do exist. This creature was standing quietly and very still, and it was checking us out. There was no doubt about it. It was a Sasquatch, and it was a big one. Picture a slimmer green Hulk-type character with black skin covered in black hair. It was standing there like a statue, all majestic, looking down on me. Up until this experience, I was only aware of the Patterson-Gimlin story in the famous video from California, and I also had seen the Boggy Creek Monster movie with some friends around 1973. I never gave it much thought after that. I was neither a believer nor a skeptic, but there it was. It strolled right off the pages of myth, legend, and folklore straight into our camp, confirming the stories to be true. It was standing next to a pine tree looking at us, or at me, since I was the only one awake and alert. I could actually see the amber glint of the fire reflecting in its big black eyes, and it was counting us, sizing us up, and taking in every detail. I think it was going somewhere in a hurry, and we just happened to be in its way. The fear that was running through me was unlike anything that can be adequately described. It was downright paralyzing. It was like being at a zoo looking at a 10-foot, 800-pound, muscle-bound man-beast that you didn't know existed, like a new species on display, and you were seeing it for the first time. The sheer size and man-like shape of it filled you with fear and it made a monstrous thing to behold. It was dangerous, too, because without a retaining wall fence or moat there to protect you, it could easily take two steps and grab you by the neck with one hand and pinch your head off. We were in the wild and only 30 feet apart, and the feeling of being completely exposed and vulnerable to this forest giant was overwhelming. The revelation that this huge, wild, man-like creature is wandering around freely and thriving on the fringe of human civilization since the dawn of time shocked me to my core. As quick as the fear rushed over me, it started to leave. My fear transformed into the feeling of accepting my fate as I recognized the fact that we just happened to occupy the same space at the same time. He could have killed us all if he wanted, but he didn't, and there was nothing we could have done to stop him. So the best I could do was sit there calmly and act like it was no big deal. I'm calling it a he because it is an alpha male thing. I just knew it was a male from its posture and sheer size and the feeling I got that he was the one controlling the moment. He wasn't hunched over either. He was standing up straight and proud. His right hand was on the pine tree to his right, and the left arm was relaxed and extended straight down to his left side, the fingers ending just above the left knee. The size of the left hand was amazingly large, as each finger looked like the size of the biggest and longest banana you could find. And it had fingernails, not claws. His forearm appeared to be longer than his bicep, which was freaking massive. 
And after about a minute of staring at each other, things started to get even more real. He moved. He began to move counterclockwise around the campsite from tree to tree to a position directly behind me. And that's when I got a good whiff of a sweaty, musky animal scent. It wasn't offensive, just a wild, wet animal scent hanging on the night air. And when he was behind me about at my six o'clock position, I remember turning my head to the side to let him know that I was aware of where he was. And I tried to act as disinterested as I could and not show any fear, even though I was still somewhat petrified. I was bluffing it with a cool, calm courage the best I could do. I had to, as I couldn't even feel my legs, so standing up and running away was completely out of the question, and I sensed that he respected the fact that I recognized who or what he was and accepted his presence, without freaking out and waking up the others. We all carried a rubberized M16 for training purposes, and I realized that mine was laying on the ground next to me. I made sure not to reach for it or even make a move in that general direction. The last thing I wanted to do was appear threatening in any way or to get this thing excited. So I just sat there quietly while throwing more sticks on the fire because I had to get a better look at this man beast. My initial fear factor was now fading into pure curiosity with a strange sense of calm due to receiving a feeling or a message that he had no intention of harming us. I can't explain this, but this is when I first realized that I may be a bit of a cognitive empath and was susceptible to some kind of mind-speak telepathy ability. It was like I could feel what it was feeling and I could hear what it was thinking. My research shows that we are all born with this ability, but it takes an active one to unlock a passive one. Without any doubt, I was clearly being told that we just happened to be in its way and were not in any real danger. He also relayed to me a message that he wasn't going to make any noise if I didn't. He even demonstrated this by not making a sound. No howls, no growls, grunts, or footfalls. He wanted to keep this encounter just between us. Because of this connection, there was an unnatural sense of admiration and respect that existed between us, and it was totally enabled by him. After a few moments, I noticed that he had moved again back to my two o'clock position, next to the tree where I first noticed him. Now, with the fire burning a little brighter, I noticed a knob where a limb had broken off on that tree just above his head. I registered that so I could determine his height later. And then he moved again, and then again, always using the trees to mask his profile. He would move only when I would break eye contact and reach down to throw more sticks on the fire. He was in stealth mode for sure. While he stood there, I was able to detect a slight shimmer of firelight off his hair, which was about four inches long and longer around the head and the chin area. I could also see a glint of firelight off the oily dark skin of his cheekbone and bridge of his nose and nostrils. I couldn't see any neck or ears due to the long black hair. The one thing that was so impressive was how something that huge and heavy could move so fluid without making a sound. If I hadn't kept an eye on him, I wouldn't have detected any movement at all. Just as I was getting used to his presence, I sensed that he was in a hurry and had to be somewhere else before sunrise. It was like he said goodbye. Shortly thereafter, the tension of the moment had left and he was gone. All sensory input that I was receiving had just dissipated and the silence lifted. He had departed on the same heading, arriving at my 5 o'clock and leaving on my 11 o'clock, heading south-southeast to wherever he was going originally. Later, after looking at the map, that heading would have placed him down in the valley just below before dawn, where all of the farms and ranches were. The early morning light came as I expected and I started the coffee. 
I was still in total awe of what had happened, and I felt physically drained and emotionally numb, with a healthy dose of euphoria mixed in for good measure. The others started to stir, and while we had breakfast, someone asked how my night was, after hearing that no one had relieved me from fire guard. I simply said without thinking, well, we had a visitor, a big two-legged hairy visitor. Yep, it was a Sasquatch. That's when the smirks and ridicule began, and the cynics started weighing in. In fact, following that event, one of my fellow cadets pulled me aside to offer some advice. He said, if you want to kill your military career before it even gets started, then keep talking about what you saw. Well, I got the message loud and clear, and I vowed never to share that story with anyone again, at least until the time was right. As the sun crested on the eastern horizon, I walked over to the tree and tried to estimate the height from the ground to the tree knob. I did this by tying a stick to one end of a string of 550 paracord and then tossed it up over the tree knob, pulling the stick tight into the notch. When I tied the knot in the cord at the bottom where it touched the ground, it would be tape measured later. It measured out to be 9.4 feet, so he was a big one for sure. I also noticed a trail of impressions in the soft pine duff. They were big impressions, two inches deep, and they went all around the camp perimeter. The prints measured out to be almost 20 inches from heel to toe, with the width being 8 inches wide. It was difficult to get an actual measurement due to the soft soil under the pine duff making none of it cast-worthy, but you could easily tell that something big and heavy had moved through the area. The stride was impressive as it measured to be about six feet between impressions. I couldn't believe my eyes when I realized that the tracks at my backside, my six o'clock position, had closed in and were only 15 feet away from me where I was sitting. He actually took advantage of my blind side and moved in for a closer look. I'm sure that is when I could smell him as it put him directly upwind from me. I consider myself fortunate to have been there and awake that night. Maybe things would have ended differently if someone else had been up watching the fire. Experiencing a myth, a legend, and an entity of folklore is not something that someone asks for as it can be a frightening experience. If you are receptive to new possibilities and find yourself in the presence of one, remain calm and respectful. In this case, seeing something that we are told does not exist becomes a life-changing, significant emotional event. From that day forward, I began to question a lot because I knew that most people didn't, and knowing the truth is an amazing feeling. If you don't actively pursue the truth in life, then you are destined to live a lie. So if you want to see one, put yourself out there in the wild and embrace your animal spirit. Enjoy nature and the great outdoors and let them find you. And that's the end of its email. Now, man, that's awesome. I believe I just read a section from his book. I'm not sure. I'm going to have to read the book to find out. But again, this is written by T.J. Neely. He is the author of Revelations, The Human Hominid Connection. Again, it was published about a year ago. I'm sure he'd love it if you check his book out. I don't know the man. I have never talked to him. I'm just, this is all coming through uh, an email that I got uh, some time back. So this is a really good story, though, and I know everyone enjoyed it, so I want to thank uh, Mr. Neely for sending this. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you for following along and listening to the podcast this far. I really do appreciate you. And I guess that's about it. we got Christmas coming up. What's Santa going to bring y'all? Let me know in the comments. All right, we'll see you guys on the next podcast. Thank you. Thank you.